So here's uh, basically an X-ray image of a of a hand, right? And remarkable spatial resolution in the X Y direction if Z is perpendicular to the plane here. You know, it's a projection, mm -hmm. but all you know the it's it's absolutely clear that these details are at a at a very high spatial resolution, and um, you know you see all these little trabecular uh, things in the bone. Uh, so it's a great high resolution technique, right? Um, and you can essentially get these high resolution pictures in real time. So for cardiac, it's it's a it's a good solution. Um, this is a fluoroscopy lab, and so the patient tables here. You can control height. You can control you know position this way a little bit. Uh, most of the position control though is from this large device here. So it's called a C arm because there's a C here with a detector and an X-ray source. You can rotate that in, I, I guess it's got four degrees of freedom or something, or more, probably six. And uh, so you pan back and forth this way, pan up and down the table. If you put the C arm over here, uh, you can rotate your angle of view of the detector and which way it's looking through the patient towards the source, right? And so this is the primary imaging modality for cardiac interventions, especially in coronaries and putting in devices like aortic valves and um, say a mitral valve or uh, a, a device that would cut off the left end, you know, the left atrial appendage. Um, this is what it looks like most of the time when it's actually being used. You've got a crowd of physicians around, or these are probably the physicians here, the two primary physicians, they're talking over what they should do next by looking at real-time pictures that are coming out of the machine. And so the detectors here, this, the source of x-rays is under here. The physician can put their foot on a pedal to generate x-rays, and it generates real-time images up here. Uh, there's support staff, nursing, um, and then Somebody back here is usually a person from the company that is that makes the device that this physician is putting in. So if it's, say, a mitral valve built by Edwards, and uh, this physician is trying to position it correctly in the, you know, the, the native mitral valve position, uh, and they're running into problems, they could ask this person uh, questions about how this should go next. And the reason is that, you know, the device manufacturers um, have experts in the field such that this person carries a lot of experience. They've seen many, many cases and uh, whatever comes up, you know, during a case, one hopes that the, the rep can, has seen one before and knows the best way to deal with it. And that's the way it goes until these physicians, you know, do many cases, like hundreds and hundreds of cases, uh, so that they're very comfortable uh, with this new device. And uh, this is an interesting profession. I mean, there's a lot of these people who watch tons of these cases and have a good feel for the underlying disease and what can go wrong in a case and how the device and the, and the procedure uh, can be modified depending on what happens. Um, the, you know, I've seen medical students, uh, up in arms on occasion, they are saying, well, you know, they do these papers, but, and they, they came up with these device, but did you know there was a Medtronic person in the lab all the time that procedure was being done <laughs> and they're irate that the, you know, an industry representative should be there and, and boy, oh boy. You really want that industry representative in that room, right? <laughs> you don't want to be flying solo uh, right off the bat. And so there is a, a, a really good you know, reason that, that person's there. Um, completely different in non-invasive imaging world in which the company that, say, makes this C-arm or the company that makes the CT scanner or the MR scanner, they bring a company rep to your hospital after the machine is in and been tested, that it works properly. Uh, and then that person runs a little course, say four days on how to run the scanner. And then they 
leave and they never come back <laughs> unless you mm-hmm. call them, right? And so it's just you're you're on your own in learning how you run that machine in your own environment. It's a different philosophy. Um, so here are the pictures that come out, right? And it's spectacular. You know, you when you look at the size of the vessels that you can see after injecting that contrast into the coronary, uh, it's it's uh, pretty detailed, right? Not only that, you you can kind of appreciate the rate at which the contrast is going from the injection site down to the most distal part of the vessel. Like that vessel filled very quickly, right? This one here, which is the LED, just like zoop, and the flow goes all the way down very quickly. And so doesn't look like there's any flow restriction on that vessel. Um, mm-hmm. The Normally this is done at, you know, 15 frames a second, something like that. Sometimes they'll go higher if they need higher temporal resolution, but mostly 15 frames a second. This catheter has a specific shape such that it can engage the root of the coronary artery um, most easily once it's come down the uh, ascending aorta, right? And so here's what the suite looks like. X-ray sources here, shoots a you know, sort of a cone of x-rays up to a detector here. This is, uh, you know, an old uh, fluoroscopy style detector or fluoroscope. Uh, There's a camera in here that looks at the picture made on this fluoroscopy uh, panel here. Uh, X-ray generator, the x-rays come out, pass through the patient, go through an anti-scatter grid, as we've discussed before, such that uh, you don't want x-rays that uh, essentially have a collision and bounce off this way coming in here because it just makes us a, a, a very sort of uh, fuzzy background that just gets in the way. Um, and then this is a, a fluorescent screen that you get essentially bright spots where photons hit it, right? And there's a camera up here looking at that screen. So uh, you're, it's essentially just taking video of this uh, screen here. In the old days, this used to be a film camera. And so when we reviewed cases, this is when I started at Hopkins, when we reviewed cases from fluoro, we used to go to a large vault and instead of digital video, we would pull out cans of film, right? And we would load the film into the player and, and watch the case, you know, uh, on film. And that's the way it was done probably until the mid nineties, I would think something like that. Um, sure, I'm giving a lecture. So, and the lecture is being recorded. So as long as you keep it down. All right. Uh, so this um, uh, image basically, you know, uh, is, is a dynamic thing that we take a movie of. Mm-hmm. The x-ray source looks like this. We have, you know, in, inside this container here, there is this thing called a, uh, basically an x-ray tube. It's like an x-ray light bulb. And uh, its design is as follows. We have a cathode here, which is at a negative voltage and an anode here, is a positive voltage. This is, you know, made of some kind of metal, uh, uh, tungsten or molybdenum for mammography. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a high voltage across this gap and boil off electrons from the ca- electrodes from the cathode. And it, they basically heat up and jump uh, from the filament here and they jump across this gap. And they're accelerated to actually a fairly high velocity, some, somewhere oftentimes in the, you know, in fractions of the speed of light. Mm-hmm. When they hit or have a collision with the atoms in here, uh, those collisions or the basically the acceleration of the electron as it slows down causes the emission of an x-ray of different energies and the x-ray beam comes out this way. This is all happening inside uh, a high vacuum and um, there's a, a motor here uh, with a bearing uh, set up uh, to spin the target. This target is actually a disc. We're looking at it from the side and the disc is spinning in order to avoid burning a hole in it with this electron beam, 
right? So you spin the disk to distribute the heating over a much uh, wider area. Uh, so the this thing, to get it hot enough to pop electrons off, you can see it gets to a very um, hot temperature. And the voltage between the anode and the cathode is set somewhere between 70 uh, kilovolts and 140 kilovolts. And hmm. um, if you set it to the low voltage, you get a certain spectrum of X-rays. High voltage, you get a different spectrum of X-rays coming out of the tube. Uh, this is what that tube looks like um, uh, when you pull it out of the scanner. Uh, this is the an spinning anode. This is the motor that spins that anode. Uh, that cathode is up here. The electrons are going to come out and hit there. And then basically the x-rays will come out this way. It's Sorry, it's upside down. Mm -hmm. um, so this thing is worth about anywhere from... $40,000 to $150,000, something like that, uh, depending on its, um, you know, sophistication and design and power, uh, et cetera. But building these uh, x-ray light bulbs or x-ray tubes is a huge part of being a provider of, say, CT and fluoroscopy systems. In order to modulate the amount of x-rays uh, coming out of the system, we can set a different tube current, and that will uh, just increase or decrease the current coming through the, the cathode filament. And that tube current is usually measured in milliampers. And so uh, depending on how your scanner is set up, uh, it can go anywhere from 10 milliamps up to modern day tubes get up to 1200 milliamps, right, to make um, a a larger flux of electrons coming across here. Ideally, uh, if we double the milliamps, we double the electrons and we double the x-rays, right, coming out of here. Um, hmm. and so that is one way of setting your intensity of your x-ray beam. The other thing you can adjust with a simple, you know, uh, switch is the energy of the x-rays. And the way you do that is change that voltage across the gap. And uh, we can look at, at the different spectrum of X-rays that, that uh, are produced when the voltage is different values. When the X-rays come out of the tube, let's say we set the kilovolt uh, on the on this this voltage here. We'll send it. We'll set it to ninety kilovolts. Okay, and let's look at the X-rays that are coming out of this thing. Um, this is the relative number of x-rays on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the energy of the x-rays coming out of the tube. No x-rays with higher energy than 90 keV can come out because we've set the voltage to 90. And so a few come out at that voltage, but most of them come out at a lower voltage. Okay. And mm -hmm. if all of those x-rays were produced by the uh, acceleration of electrons as it hits or interacts with molecules in the target, um, the spectrum of energies would look something like this. The relative number of x-rays would just be a, a straight line and it increases to some value, you know, set by sort of the MA. But in reality, what comes out of the tube is something that looks like this red curve. And the reason is the low energy x-rays uh, get absorbed by a number of uh, things on their way out of the, the x-ray tube. So they can get absorbed by the target itself. They can get absorbed by the glass that is, uh, you know, surrounding the tube. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll probably put filters in to remove as many of these low energy x-rays as possible because these things have no chance of getting all the way through the patient. And so all they would do is deposit uh, dose. And so when you look at the, the spectrum of X-ray tubes, as we change the energy on that, the, the voltage between the anode and the cathode from 60 to 80 to 100 to 120 kilovolts, these are the different spectra that emerge from the tube. And so as we go up, not only do we get higher energy X-rays, but but we actually get a, a lot more in the integral under this distribution. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a lot higher than it is when we set this to 60 keV or 
uh, 60 kilovolts with the same MA. So they, the full flux of X-rays that are coming out go essentially as, as KV squared, right? So you can change your MA uh, in order to make this a, a larger value uh, when you have lower KEV. And so if we set our KEV to 80 and we increase the MA on the tube, then you can see we get a higher uh, number of X-rays as that MA goes up. Um, modern X-ray tubes, this is a, a very significant goal, which is to uh, supply a lot of X-rays at lower energies. Because this is sort of the sweet spot for imaging uh, uh, folks. Uh, when we're up at these higher energies, we're depositing a lot more dose into the patient uh, per X-ray. And so these ones actually are, are can produce uh, a better image, especially in patients who are of smaller size. So if you have somebody who's 150 pounds and their BMI is like 25, you can make a great picture with these x-rays. If they're 300 pounds and their BMI is you know, 35, then you probably want to use x-rays up here because you need to get through the patient. But it gives you an opportunity to really minimize dose in some people with, with this. And so the modern set of x-ray tubes that are being sold by manufacturers now, at these low KEVs, you can get very high milliamp values, like 1,200 uh, in order to produce uh, this kind of spectrum. Hmm. Okay. Got a question for you. One thing, if you're gonna look at the spatial resolution of your uh, fluoroscopy system, one thing that you have to consider is the fact that there is a an area on the anode that is used to produce the x-rays. So it's, the x-rays don't all come from a single spot and then emanate out uh, to produce a shadow. They come from a, essentially a rectangle on the anode. And so you, you can that causes a, a slight blurring, obviously, of the picture because you have essentially a, a, a set of positions from which the, the x-rays are coming. And they'll produce slightly different uh, images. Uh, and the other uh, aspect that occurs is depending on where you are in your field of view, the image of the spot size, when you look at it from your detector, looks different. So if I'm over here and I'm looking back towards the spot size, I get a more rectangular looking spot. If I'm over here and I look up towards my detector, I get a very small uh, area you know, from the spot size, right? And so there, here we have a different, um, uh, essentially, amount of area that we need to convolve with our image to produce the correct model of what's going on. So that's sort of a second order effect you have to take into consideration if you're gonna really do uh, precise measurements of spatial resolution. Um, ways of imaging the spot size, for example, are you take a piece of aluminum foil or say a piece of aluminum with a tiny hole in it and you make a pinhole camera and you put that in in your scanner at a specific field of view and here's your uh, spot up here, which is a rectangle. And then you're going to make a picture of that rectangle on your detector. And so you can actually just image the spot and see what it, it looks like. Right. There's another effect in angiography called the heel effect. And uh, what happens here is that uh, if, if we're looking at x-rays that have come along this trajectory, uh, those x-rays when they were made inside the anode had to pass through more target material to get out of the anode to get down here than the x-rays that come along this way. These have a very short path out of the anode. And so you get a higher intensity of x-ray, uh, uh, so, you know, your source of x-rays is, is higher here than it is back here. And I think we saw that when we looked at the detector, the CT detector, uh, with nothing in the scanner. You could see the variation of gains on the detectors, but you could also see the variation intensity from uh, this heel effect 
And also the another major thing was the bow tie in CT. Um, you can get extremely high spatial resolution with fluoroscopy by in measured in line pairs per millimeter, right? Uh, and one way of looking at that is to take a target, something like this, that has line pairs per millimeter uh, uh, elements in it, and uh, set the field of view of your flat panel display uh, such that, say, it's 45 centimeters or even higher here. So this is when the flat panel is close to the object and the source of x-rays is far away. And as we move the source of x-rays towards the, the object and the detector farther away, uh, our field of view decreases, right? So what we see on the detector decreases and we essentially blow it up, we zoom it up. And if we're looking at a very small field of view, say 12 centimeters, then we look at that target with that small uh, field of view and we can measure the line pairs per millimeter three and a half line pairs per millimeter, which is, you know, a really high uh, spatial resolution. So depending on what you're doing, you want to set your field of view by setting the position of the detector and the source with respect to the patient uh, such that they get the correct magnification. And so in cardiac, you know, the field of view is usually around 20 centimeters. Um, and, you know, on the flat panel, you're getting almost three line pairs per millimeter uh, with that you know, on a typical system. Uh, just in the same way we looked at contrast resolution um, in CT, uh, in x-ray fluoroscopy, you can just place this thing on, on you know, the patient table and image it. And it has these little contrast beads uh, inside it. And they're the same uh, for each step level. However, here the contrast beads are mapped onto uh, a much thicker substance. And so the number of x-rays emitted out of here uh, is much lower. And it gives you pictures that look something like this, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty because just the number of x-rays that hit the target is low here. Whereas here, mm -hmm. a lot of x-rays have come through the target and the relative contrast between these dots and the background is quite high, right? So this is analogous to that contrast detail curve we saw in CT. And um, as the you know, contrast goes down, we still see it at this level of noise. But then at a certain level, we can say, well, we're, we're absolutely uncertain of, of the existence of something there, right? So that's a simple calibration you can do with a phantom like this with your fluoro system. So one of the reasons why uh, the fluoroscopy pictures themselves look so nice is that uh, instead of taking continuous x-ray emission and taking continuous sampling, uh, we basically strobe the x-ray source. And uh, so it, it's a set of flashes as opposed to a continuous x-ray emission. So if I have continuous fluoroscopy here and I have low MA, I can just keep my x-rays on, and what I'll do is I'll integrate up how much I detect, you know, here, right, for a specific time, say 30 milliseconds, right, at 30 frames per second. But when I run my strobe uh, x-ray source, I now have things on for only eight milliseconds, but I have enough juice, a high enough MA that I can produce you know, uh, a much higher fluence here. And I, I get this uh, amount of x-rays that hit the patient in a much shorter time. And so essentially what this does is it, it just decreases the shutter speed of this camera, right? This shutter speed was 33 milliseconds and this is eight, right? And so now when we play a movie of these pictures, it looks like really clear pictures, whereas these ones uh, had blurring on them. Most um, interventions, when they're doing real-time manipulation of catheters and things like that, they'll go down to 15 frames per second for dose reasons, and sometimes even down to seven. It, it depends on the, the physician, what, what they like, right? Uh, I'm just going to skip this one. So <clears throat> the 
for cardiac, uh, as we've talked about before, a classic way of imaging the coronary arteries is to put this catheter in the femoral artery down in the patient's leg. So you have to dissect this out, find the femoral arteries, make a slit in it, and put this in. And then you move the catheter up their descending aorta up over the arch and then down the ascending aorta. Okay. And then here's the catheter. This is a plastic tube. It usually runs on top of a metal guide wire that gives it um, sort of more firm uh, control. Uh, and now if, if we just stayed here uh, in the, you know, ascending aorta, and we squirt a dye out, it would, at certain phases, run down the coronary arteries, right? Normally what's done is though you engage, you bring that thing right in here and you put it into a single artery, which we'll see. But mm -hmm. also you can imagine at certain phases of the heart, when the left ventricle contracts and this valve opens, all that stuff's gone. It's just like whoosh, comes, comes back around here. Yeah. But fundamentally, what we're looking for is just the geometry of the vessel. And if it has one of these, right, which is a stenosis, then we have to decide whether or not we go in and fix it. And I guess there's a movie of this whole process, right? Yeah, okay. So here's the introducer goes into the uh, femoral. You bring the guide wire up. So this is a really thin wire. You bring a catheter over top of the wire. And now we're going to extend the catheter. We'll pull the guide wire back. And here this catheter has usually a bend in it that's customized to, and when you come down the ascending aorta, it's customized to either go in the right or the left, uh, depending on the geometry of the heart. And But you do want to curve at the end here, right, to get it to, get it to go in here. Mm -hmm. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, right? Okay. So these plastic tubes with a little marker on the end, so you can see them on x-rays. Um, you know, these curvatures, you know, are all designed and you can pull them off the shelf um, depending on what you feel is optimal for the patient. Um, some people even bring them out and custom bend them in real time, like heat, heat the, the catheter and then like put an extra bend if it's not working, right? Um, so here's, uh, basically, oh, I see. This is a comparison of femoral and radial access. And so, uh, recently, I would say in the last, last mm -hmm. 10 years or so, uh, some clinicians have been introducing the catheter through the, the radial artery, which is on a patient's wrist, right? So you don't do the femoral cut down. Uh, you you put the catheter in through the radial artery, and so therefore it's it's going to come in this way. One of the, I guess, advantages of that is just easier access. If there's a lot of stuff in the way between their femoral artery and their aorta, many patients have very tortuous vessels along the way, and a lot of um, stenosis and and um, calcification. Right, so the trip from the femoral artery to here may not be simple, right? Uh, these are usually slightly smaller catheters also. And so, uh, you know, depending on which one you're using, uh, the curvature also might be different for uh, engaging the coronary, right? So you get the right one out of the, out of the cupboard. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, so, this is something that if if you're going to do interventions and and it's something that you should know just uh, sort of like the back of your hand because when inv interventions are ongoing somebody will call out they want you know a specific view and you have to know what the heck they're talking about right so if we have the x-ray source down here and the patient's on the table and here's you know an old style fluoroscope nowadays this is usually a digital uh, x-ray detector here, but here's an old style fluoroscope. And um, uh, this is just a general AP view, it's called. So remember our camera and this thing is up here. So we're looking down this way uh, when we're looking at the images. Uh, and if we look at, at 
from the patient's feet, it looks something like this. So that we're looking from their A to posterior, the anterior to posterior view. And uh, it would be like a chest X-ray view, right? Mm -hmm. And when you, you start looking at the coronaries or the heart, you usually angle the uh, detector and the source uh, such that you get a better view of the heart. For example, just from this way, you've got the sternum and a whole bunch of things in the way, right? There's bones uh, over top of a lot of interesting parts of the heart here. And so you rotate uh, the C-arm such that the source comes here and the detector's over here. And this is called a uh, RAO view, right? So that's basically the place from which you're viewing is now over the patient's right arm. So you've rotated towards the right side and that's a positive angle. This is called the primary angle. And then if you want to look at the heart from the other direction uh, and you rotate the detector this way, that's called an LAO view, okay? And those yeah. are negative angles. They're stored in the DICOM header at this, at this location. And if it's positive, it's RAO. If it's negative, it's LAO, right? And you actually uh, when you're trying you to look the... at uh, a set of vessels, like coronary vessels, many of those vessels might, in, from this view, uh, sit one on top of the other. So you need uh, essentially an orthogonal view to eliminate that and look at those vessels from a different angle to, to pick up anything you missed. In addition to this primary angle, there's a secondary angle in which we can tilt the uh, place or the, our view um, orientation towards the patient's head or toward the patient's feet. And when we go towards their head, it's called the cranial direction and that's positive. And when we go to their feet, it's called the caudal direction and that's a negative angle. And this is the secondary angle. So in these two DICOM tags in that image, you're going to know exactly where the detector is and where the, you know, the source is in this line of view. For just the same reasons, uh, you know, you need to, to look at, at vessels from different locations in order to get a clear shot of the vessel depending on the patient. So knowing this stuff is quite useful when your day-to-day -day existence in the interventional suite, right? Mm -hmm. And so here's a, an example. Can you hear me okay? of the same coronary tree with four different injections uh, from four different uh, views, right? So you can see there's uh, considerable overlap, but here, this is sort of the left main here, uh, considerable overlap of this background vessel and this foreground vessel that you can get rid of by doing a caudal cranial uh, uh, adjustment Right, so now we're we've moved on this side. We've moved our detector up towards the patient's head, so we're looking more down on their coronaries. And you can see this overlap now is gone. Here, um, we're we're looking more from their feet, and these two vessels completely overlap. We get a great view of this vessel. Right, uh, there isn't a single view that works for everybody. Right, uh, and then here. Uh, we've gone over to the left side. Now we're looking from the left side of the patient to the LAO view, and we get a great view of their left anterior descending coronary artery because that's you know runs down the central column. And this is from their remember their head looking down from their head towards their feet, kind of. And then here we're looking from their feet up towards their their head. Um, so it takes four different injections, um, but most of the time uh, it's at, at least four four views are are used okay uh, i'm not sure what i wanted to say about this one. Oh, i guess these are just two different views in the same patient okay. yeah can you hear me okay um i think so uh, if we look at an x-ray uh, angiography and compare it with uh, CT. Remember when we looked at CT, we saw a, a reasonable you know, depiction of the vessel. This is nothing like the depiction we are, we're seeing in these pictures though, right? I mean, 
these are you know super high resolution you see these tiny little vessels coming off of them and stuff like that uh however for a, a large abnormality or a large you know stenosis we're going to pick it up with ct and when you run your let's say i i run through the stenosis this way and then i run through the orthogonal direction and i plot and i take a picture of what's in this blue plane it looks like this and the and the thing's just gone right so it it is really uh severely stenotic right so you you can in the ct world uh essentially um come up with a scale of severity that maps pretty darn closely with what you see on uh, x-ray angiography. One place that it's super hard uh, to overlap the two is when in the CT, you have really high calcium in and around this thing. It, it kind of masks the details of the stenosis and you have to be a very experienced reader um, in order to look around the calcium. But as we saw before with the CT, what we can do is we can segment out that vessel and then run a computer simulation or just to run a deep learning algorithm to come up with what the predicted uh, uh, FFR measurement would be if we put a catheter in there. And, um, and this has turned out to be uh, quite instrumental in bringing CT into a clinical practice. Uh, these are venograms, which uh, basically you inject blood down here uh, and you can see, and it, and it in retrograde uh, fills uh, the venous space, but on the heart, you can see like just the size of the veins. They get really huge as they get towards the right atrium, right? And so these are often used as um, uh, uh, highways to get to different places in the heart with a catheter. So if I want to make an injection on the heart, or I want to put a pacing lead on the heart. Oftentimes these veins, after they're mapped like this, are used to get places, right? Because they're so large. Um, TAVR is a, is a um, therapeutic intervention that's occurred in the last 10 years. And um, it is done under fluoroscopy, right? So when, when the uh, valve is placed, in the patient, you have two things going on. You have a transesophageal echocardiography image being produced, and you have a uh, fluoroscopy, real-time fluoroscopy being produced. And so you can see the device with fluoro because it's got markers and it's obviously got metal in it. And under uh, TEE, you can uh, see essentially the some of the, the soft tissues, et cetera, and whether or not it's at the right level. And so this is, it looks pretty busy, you know, when it's being done and you've got all of these devices uh, in there. And this is the TEE probe. This patient has obviously had surgery before uh, going on and, uh, you know, in, so this is sort of real-time fluoroscopy of what's being viewed as uh, the device is, is being placed. Uh, so this is uh, just for your, records um uh, you know as of 2014 <clears throat> this is what you know american college of cardiology uh says the total effective dose in radiation is for different procedures right mm -hmm. and uh this says a lot of them are outdated already uh for example prospectively triggered axial coronary ct says it goes up to seven millisieverts. So that's rarely done anymore. Uh, although it does give it a good bottom end. It says it's a half millisievert. Um, but interestingly, you know, if you're going to do a fluoroscopy, x-ray fluoroscopy, and so you're doing a diagnostic invasive coronary, it's two to 20 millisieverts, right? So that would be like 10 CTs, right? The, you know, to do a invasive coronary. And then when you're doing these interventions, like a, uh, basically a TAVR, uh, a TAVR with transfemoral, you're looking at 30 to 100 millisieverts, right? So it's like 50 CTs. So, you know, the 
we, we get a lot of flack and CT about dose, principally because so many people get CTs, right? But these other uh, technologies are producing uh, much higher doses. So, you know, the rest stress uh, nuclear medicine was up in the 20s. So there's a very interesting chart. All of these are getting pushed down lower and lower. And so if we go back, I think, to uh, something we probably started with, which is like, here are our principal imaging technologies and, you know, the voxel dimensions, which is a, a poor man's way of, of talking about um, spatial resolution, right? We, we now know that uh, you really want the full width at half max of point spread function. Uh, but this, you know, gives you an idea. We'll, we'll say like you could, you know, image the point spread function with these. Um, and here's the imaging times, right? And uh, many orders of magnitude different between say SPECT and fluoro, where you have eight milliseconds versus 600 seconds. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, any type of imaging you want is available on this chart, right? So it's a, it's a very interesting space uh, to be in right now because all of these technologies are, are sort of jockeying for position. And so that's, that's the course. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, we, we now know a lot about CT and echo and SPECT and PET and MR and, and fluoro. And um, I would ask if you uh, get a request uh, for the course review, please don't just, you know, uh, ignore it. Fill that course review out because the, both the department and the, the School of Engineering look at those things uh, quite seriously in, you know, designing the curriculum and figuring out what um, are uh, thought of as, as positive courses, right? So please fill that thing out. And I will see you all on Wednesday, uh, June 14th, I believe it is. And we're going to get started at 8 a.m., okay? So I know it's early, but uh, it'll be a good day because we'll, we'll see a lot of uh, good uh, projects, okay?